So for the first time ever in a video, Brad's going to join me in a little tipple since we're talking about something so stupid. So yeah, Brad. Ching ching, motherfucker. Let's go. So we're just going to jump straight into this one today because I genuinely can't believe I get to talk about something called cello scrotum and still market this series of videos as being educational in nature. Did you say cello scrotum? Yes, I did. This is my job. I get paid money to do this. What is cello scrotum? Well, cello scrotum, for those of you at home who are curious, and for all the men currently wincing in pain and crossing their legs, it's not a real medical condition. However, for three decades, starting from 1974, doctors absolutely thought it was, all thanks to a single letter written by one Dr. Elaine Murphy. Yeah, so Brad, I can see you struggling for words there, my friend, about how to possibly broach the subject of how pray tell, did a woman in the 1970s with a single letter somehow convince the entire medical community about the existence of this nebulously defined condition known as cello scrotum? And I'll tell you, Brad, she did it as a joke. Specifically, according to a 2009 interview given by Dr. Murphy, explaining that cello scrotum was in fact something she made up all those years ago, she was inspired to create the condition after reading an article in the British Medical Journal about something called guitar nipple. That one also sounds made up. It does, doesn't it? And we'll get to that in a moment. But I should point out that the naming conventions we're talking about here aren't that far out of the realm of possibility for naming medical conditions. Obviously, tennis elbow is a thing. And obviously, people don't know tennis elbows, where you're like, it's a strain in the elbow commonly suffered by tennis players without how often they hit the rackets. And then there's boxer sprain, is all that springs to mind, which is a sprain commonly suffered by, who would have guessed it, boxers when they punch things. And obviously, that's what they refer to it in actual medical literature. It just so happens that the ones we're talking about today are guitar nipple and cello scrotum. Oh, don't forget jogger's nipple as well. Oh, who can forget jogger's nipple? If you don't know what jogger's nipple is, first of all, you're lucky. Second of all, it's a serious fucking deal, and it's caused by like friction of like a shirt constantly rubbing against your nips. And as you can imagine, it's constantly suffered by joggers, hence the name joggers nipple. But like, you can see pictures of it like during marathons and stuff like that. And you'll see marathon runners who, for some inexplicable reason, decide to wear white, running with just blood streaming out of the nips. And you think, <laughs> is the world record worth bleeding nips? And I'm going to say no. If they said to me, Carl, you could be a world-class runner, I'm saying, oh, wow. It's going to take years of training and months of hard work, but you will get there. Like, oh, wow, I, I think I could do that. Also, your nips will bleed. Like, now nah, I'm all right. I'm good. <laughs> you know what? No. Nah. It's like if they told me like, being a world-class marathon runner means bleeding nips, you might have to take a shit back side at road, like Paula Radcliffe did, and have the world media watch and take pictures of it. It's like, you know what? I think I might try rowing. The thing that always cracks me up about joggers' nipple is that they always wear like band-aids and stuff over the nipples and it disappoints me that no one's ever gone to the logical extreme and just worn like nipple tassels over the end. <laughs> <laughs> or done the thing and just cut a hole around the nipples and or run in a mesh shirt. Like they're in some sort of like 80s warehouse rave or some shit like that. So that'd be awesome. That's those uh, guys in South Park who ripped the nipples off and they could have those. It's like as well when you're running, wear one of those um, uh, those onesies that have like the butt flap. So when you need a shit, so you don't need to bend down. I think that was an isolated incident. What, Paula Radcliffe shitting herself? Yeah, like, considering that we know the name of the person who did it, it's not like every marathon runner has to shit on the side well, of the road. It's like, there's so many sports where you have to, like, just take, like, that embarrassment in, in your stride. Like, there's so many football goalkeepers who just piss themselves during matches. So, you know, this is a thing. Like, football goalkeepers, obviously, you've got to spend, like, four... You can't leave... In the middle of the game, so you've got to stand there. And I think there's one guy where the guy, goalkeeper, like crouched by his side at net, and you can see the stream of piss coming out the bottom of his shorts, and they caught it on TV. Oh. But you've got to go, when you've got to go, you've got to go. It's not like you've got to, like, and the thing is, though, his team said, well, good on him. Commitment right there. He pissed himself rather than No, 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 no. He was marking his territory. <laughs> that was his goal. Like the other players run towards the goal. Oh, God, no, it belongs to him. Do it reminds me a lot of that? That story we talked about before of that rugby player who shoved his finger up the arse of other players during the scrum. And I think there's a picture out there of him doing it if you can find it. It's like, <laughs> he's getting in there, man. He's knuckles fucking deep on these dudes. And like, I think the other players are like, we're not playing with him. To the point where like, you go into the scrum and everyone's like, no. <laughs> and that's like, what tactic is that? How do you defeat that tactic? Like, they should do that more. Like, like, so the, uh, they should do that more. In most sports, people shut their hands on people's asses. No, I mean, just break the rules in ways that aren't like, anticipated to the point where the referee has to go and get the rule book out and go, I don't know what rule he's breaking, but he's definitely doing something wrong. Like when Vinnie Jones that one time grabbed that other player by the knackers. 
And the famous picture of Vinnie Jones, the football player, grabbing a player by the nutsack and going, like that. And the other players like that going, and the other players that like, I didn't want to report into the referee because how? How do I say that that player over there, you need to book him? Why? He grabbed my nuts. <laughs> so, he what? He, he grabbed my nuts. And then what did he? He twisted really hard. It's like, is that against the rules? I don't know. It sounds it's one of those, it sounds like it should be, but I don't think it is. The most famous example is the with a cricket bar. Where there was a there was a there was never a ruling place for how wide a cricket bat could be. So somebody <laughs> no, somebody this originally is, this made is not all the real. This is a real one. I think, oh, it, was, that, I think I it was on QI. I thought you were talking about the underarm bowler. Oh no! Like, uh, this is a great fucking story about like, sports that no one gives a shit about in cricket specifically. Um, uh, you can un- there's no rule against underarm bowling, but it's it's frowned upon to do it. And there was a game once between like Australia and some other team or something like that where the other team had to score the most points possible to win the game. So the bowler just rolled under arm. And when he did it, I think every other player on the opposite team walked off in disgust because they knew that they couldn't win. And I think even the commentator called him a dick. <laughs> and the commentator was like the guy's brother who was bowling. And they banned that outright because so many people got pissed off about it. It's like, it's not against the rules. It's just frowned upon. But it's like this how this is where rules come from in sport when someone yeah. tries to break well, them. Well, it's like um, the shot clock in basketball. Do you know why they put, like, people don't follow basketball. I think when you hold the ball, you're like 10... 15, 20, I don't know how long, you've got a certain amount of time to shoot the ball. Yeah. Because originally, there was no l- limit on how long you could hold the ball. So I think during one match, it was between a really good team and a really bad team. The bad team just held on to the ball and at some points just sat on it. And the opposing team, obviously, you're not allowed to touch your oppo- the opposing player in basketball. So you just got the ball, put it on the floor and sat on it for the entire duration of like quarters. And the other team's like, we don't know how to defeat this. <laughs> this tactic is unbeatable. And I think they ended up with like a score of like 11 and two, which in basketball is like ridiculous. So we could talk about this shit all day and we're going to, because another example that springs to mind is a football match between, I think like two, I think two teams in like the, uh, the Africa league or something like that, where in football, one of the rules is, uh, in overtime, a goal counts as two points. And one particular team needed two points to win against the team they were playing against. And they were winning by one goal. And they couldn't score the other goal to like, you know, get the two points necessary to win. So what they did is in the last like five minutes of the game, scored an own goal to make it a draw. So which would put it into overtime, which, at which point they could win by one goal, which would instantly end the game and get two points for it. I think how it worked is for the last 10 minutes of that game, that team defended both goals because the other team then tried to score an own goal because even though the other team would win, they wouldn't win by enough points. So basically both teams were trying to score an own goal and they changed that rule as well. And that's amazing. I love that shit. That reminds me of that time when, I think it was fairly recent actually, someone took a shot on goal and it clipped off like a pigeon and went in and they had to count it. Because there's no yeah, rule saying that well, the obstructions on the The Liverpool goal, don't. wasn't it, where someone put a balloon on the pitch yeah. and the ball went off a balloon and scored a goal. And I think my favourite part of that was, I think it's when Torres had just got in. Like, he's a player who's famous for having, I think, 5,000 minutes or some stupid amount like that of time on the pitch as a striker without ever scoring a goal or scoring an assist. And the joke was that that balloon in its two minutes on the field had <laughs> scored more assists than fucking Torres. <laughs> Which, I love stuff like that. Because, like, what are you supposed to do? It's like when you get goals that are scored by bobbles. Like bobbles on the field, like little mounds of dirt that people don't anticipate. And the ball just bounces over the goalkeeper and it's like, oh well, fuck It's me. like with uh, rugby or with uh, American football, that's obviously an issue because of the way the ball bounces. Yes. Yeah. And obviously the longer you play, the more you can well, play Well, that's the snowplow game. I told you we're going to talk about this all day. I know, all, I know loads. The snowplow game is a game between two football t- like American football teams where um, uh, it was so, like, I think, a foot of snow and neither team could really score. And at, well, the last minute, they had like a free goal or goal kick or whatever they call it in American football. And randomly, out of nowhere, without being prompted, like the caretaker of the game drove like um, a, a snow clearing machine onto the field by accident and just so happened to do donuts around the part where we're about to take the field goal. <laughs> they told they shoot him off the pitch, and then the, the team, like who that guy like worked for, kicked from that spot, like which was now clear of snow, and won the game. It's known as like the snowplow game or something like that. And I oh, it's so good. I love shit like that. More sports need to do that. That's great. Before we carry on. Yeah. Top me up, please. <laughs> oh god, this is gonna go so wrong. Oh god. That's fine. There we go. Yeah, but here's the best bit now, because now you've got the you've got the Pepsi. <laughs> so now I have to hold my glass off camera and then you need to fill my glass up. Uh, 
Uh, ching, 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 oh god, this is gonna be so awful. Yeah, right over your fucking TV, mate. Uh, oh, brown liquid. Uh, oh, you need a brown liquid on your TV. Uh, Whoa! I'm okay, kidding. Victory. Done. So, Carl, we've covered jogger's nipple. Tell us more about guitar nipple. Well, guitar nipple, from my extensive Googling on the subject, as far as I can tell, is a form of contact dermatitis commonly suffered by guitar players who hold the guitar too close to their chest. And I'm going to presume that the Beatles especially suffered terribly with guitar nipple, considering how high they used to hold their guitars early in their career. So it's the same principle as joggers nipple yeah, with the guitar. Yeah, which is why I'm glad you there. brought it up, because it made a really nice segue. <laughs> Other than like, you know, the 10 minute detour we took through sport loophole stories that we half remembered from the internet. I'm presuming that I'm going to have to call a lot of them because they're wrong. Oh yeah. No, all of them are right. I never met mistakes. 100%, yeah. Just like unforced errors. <laughs> it's like we're leaving spelling mistakes and things in videos. Yeah. See if people pick them up. Yeah, we do it just to make keep people on their toes. Yeah, yeah. So right. that, that video with the frame missing that's going up tomorrow. Yeah, that's the one. According to Dr. Murphy, she took one look at this article in the British Medical Journal and began laughing her absolute tits off alongside her husband because she couldn't believe such a respected publication that talked about something so stupid. We shouldn't laugh, Carl. It's a very, very serious issue. Yeah. Like, right, Guitar Nipple, like, claims the lives of at least one guitarist every year annually. It's like, they need to do PSAs on this shit and just have, like, black and white footage of just, like, get famous guitarists just crying over their guitars, like, they're, because their chosen profession caused them so much pain and anguish. And you know the only song they could play over that as well? While my guitar gently weeps. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of all around me are familiar. Well, that's a good one, isn't it? Thing is though, I can't listen to Mad World by Gary Jules anymore without just seeing the Gears of War fucking trailer. Because every time, like that's supposed to be a really sad song, it? like Mad World, it's like dun 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 dun. But I can't hear the opening bars of that song without just seeing Marcus Phoenix firing a Lancer machine gun at a fucking corpse. And the best way thing in Gears of War 3, when I think Dom, spoilers, Big Dick Dom, dies, they play Mad World as he crashes a giant flaming truck into the Locust. So that song has now lost all impact on me, because all I ever see is just a, a group of big dumb meathead marines just crashing into aliens with like chainsaw guns in their hand. Hopefully now from now on all you'll see is like Slash holding his nipples in black and white, weeping at the camera. Well that's the thing though isn't it, because like I did do some research on guitar nipple and while the British Medical Journal insist that it's a real condition that guitarists suffer with. I've never heard of any guitarist anywhere ever complain about it. The most complained about thing with guitars is how much they weigh. And a good example of this, like as a bonus fact, is Kurt Cobain. So people don't know, Kurt Cobain was left-handed in real life, but he learned to play guitar right-handed because it was cheaper. And obviously it's more rock and roll to learn how to play the wrong way, isn't it? And he had a problem with his spine, I think it was, where he had like a slight curvature of the spine, which was like compounded by the fact he played the guitar the wrong way. And what he did is he self-medicated with heroin, which obviously led to his, like, his overdose and his death. And like experts have said, like if he'd have bought a left-handed guitar, and um, the curvature of his spine went to the right. So if he'd have bought another guitar that went left, the weight would have actually corrected the problem and Kurt Cobain might still be alive today. So Kurt Cobain was killed by his guitar. Fuck guitar nipple, like murderous guitars are out there, man. Right handed guitars are killing rock stars left and right, or at least to the left. I had to think really hard about it when I'm getting that right then. <laughs> You had, that, to pick, you had to pick the right one. I then. did, yeah. That would have been a 50-50 had to redo that entire take. You had to pick the right one, which was the left one. Yeah, and then if I was on the left one, that would have been right. Yeah. But the right one would have been wrong. And if it had been wrong, I'd have to go to the left one, which wouldn't have been right. See, I'm... I think. <laughs> I'm lucky, because whenever I talk about my heart condition, I always say, oh, my heart's in the right. And they're like, it's, it's the right it's side. It's in the right place. Yeah, it's the right place. That's, that's the joke people use to me. So, understandably, Murphy laughed her ass off. Oh, yeah, she found this entire thing hilarious. And what was her response following the laughter? She decided to try and slip something else under the radar and create a condition even stupider than guitar nipple. Enter cello scrotum. <laughs> so we know that cello scrotum isn't a real thing. Oh, no, it's complete and utter bullshit that was made up by one doctor having a laugh in the 1970s. But what does she say the symptoms were? She didn't really list any, as far as I'm aware. So I've researched hello scrotum extensively, so you can all be sure of that. But as far as I'm aware, she just described it's like, you know, this nebulous pain in the scrotal region suffered by male cello players, and that was apparently enough to get her letter that she wrote to the British Medical Journal published. They didn't. They did. Just to be clear, I have actually researched cello scrotum and couldn't find any definitive description of what exactly it is or what it's caused by, which has led me to assume it involves a combination of crushing, chafing and carefully concealed woodpeckers. 
So you said she managed to get this published in the British Medical Journal. Yes, the very reputable British Medical Journal, one of the most respected medical journals on the entire planet. How? Well, <laughs> I should probably point out, if I wrote a letter to like the BMJ tomorrow saying, yes, I have like, you know, noticed uh, amongst my musician friends a, a strange new condition afflicting them all, I am dubbing today Triangle Players Bellend and sign that shit Carl Smallwood, CEO, MD, Big Wangers Incorporated, they write that thing off as a joke. But what Dr. Elaine Murphy did, she, like, obviously using her credentials as a doctor, filled her letter with loads of medical jargon that made it sound more, you know, plausible, and then signed it with her husband's name to hide the fact that she was doing it. She didn't want her name linked to something like Scrocello Scrocum. But her husband's <laughs> name is fine. Well, he wasn't a doctor, so it's fine. Well, like, obviously, like, she didn't want her medical like credentials being fucked up by the fact like something like um, like cello scrotum, and she just thought it'd be funny to write in and just see. Imagine her surprise when the BMJ published her letter and its findings in its very next issue. Did they not even fact check it? Well, you don't need to, Brad, because they had all the evidence they needed in a single letter from a doctor they'd never heard of, saying, "Oh yeah, lots of male cellists that I've met." really have sore nut sacks. This is a, like, a medical issue that needs to be discussed. I like to think now that the British Medical Journal, actually, the people there actually went and talked to cellists. Do you ever get pain in your balls when playing? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you know. Do you know what this reminds me of? Like, it's the whole thing with MSG. Like, do you know like, the, the, the food additive MSG? Yeah, I've yeah. researched this and I was astounded to find out the only reason, literally the only reason people think MSG is bad for you is because of one guy. Literally, one guy wrote a letter to an American journal sometime in like the 1980s saying, I went for Chinese food last night and I got a headache. I'm calling this problem Chinese food syndrome or Chinese takeaway syndrome and hypothesized that it was caused by the amount of MSG added to Chinese food. That was it. One guy had a headache after eating Chinese food once and blamed it on MSG. They published that in an issue of the next journal a lot of people said, oh wow, like confirmation bias. I also got a headache after gorging myself on cheap Chinese food. It's obviously the Chinese food's fault, not the fact I just went out and ate a load of salty food and didn't drink water for five hours. And it's like, that's why, for years and years and years, that's why MSG was like banned in everything. Because one guy got a headache after eating a Chinese. One guy could not handle his Chinese. This is why flat earthers think they can't trust science. <laughs> this is why, because they published stuff that hasn't been verified. It was verified. One guy had a headache. Oh no! <laughs> Just like this one. Oh yeah, one doctor said, I've seen five cellists who've got sore balls. This is, this is a condition. This is an affliction that plagues our orchestras. So like, they're suffering in silence. Well, not really silence, just really loud droning noise. They go visit the cellist's court and they all straddle the cellos as they play. No, that's the thing, because like, this is why Dr. Murphy found it so hilarious that it was like just like the British Medical Journal accepted her claims at face value because there is no physical way for a male cello player to sit in a way that would ever hurt his testicles. Like there's no way to hold a cello and sit with it that would in any way impact your nutsack unless you were holding it wrong. Unless you're holding it like a guy in an 80s hair metal band and shoving it directly into your nutsack while strumming it, there is no way to play a cello so that your nutsack will be injured or in the line of fire, as it were. And that's why one of the reasons like Murphy found it so funny, and probably why she came up with the idea of cello nutsack, sorry, cello scrotum. Proper as a medical term. Yeah, the proper please. medical term, yeah. Because she realised like there's no way that a cello player could actually hurt their scrotum, but it kind of sounds like something that might happen. So you open this by saying that this was around for 30 years. 30 straight years. Yeah, for 30 years, if you were a male cello player, you could be diagnosed with cello scrotum. Was this not just something that was published once and then in 30 years later she revealed it was fake? No, no, cause if that was the case, this wouldn't be funny. But no, many doctors who read that article like rightfully said, this is bullshit, this is not a real thing, and wrote letters to the British, British Medical Journal saying, it's not real. You can't suffer from like painful scrotum from playing a cello. Please, like you know, retract this article and like and issue an apology. And they never did. <laughs> Even though, despite the fact, remember, there was no factual basis whatsoever for the claims Dr. Murphy was making, and she wrote it probably while like drunk on two glasses of wine with her husband while laughing. As a result of this, for thirty straight years, cello scrotum was a formally recognised medical condition you could be diagnosed with. 
this obviously begs the question, has anybody actually been diagnosed with cello scrotum? That I do not know, unfortunately, which is understandable given that men who suffer pain in their scrotum don't tend to talk about it all that much. What I do know, though, is that 35 years after that original article was published, the BMJ was still publishing articles about it, and that original study had been cited by multiple other people. So it was still around and was still a thing that many people were aware of. And especially in like the cello playing community, um, it was a, a rumour that constantly circulated like, amongst like, you know, orchestras. Like, yeah, if you play the cello for too long, you can, you know, like, just injure your scrotum. Which is like kind of hilarious to me. So there are legitimate like medical conditions like a lot of people in orchestras do um, suffer from. I think tinnitus is one that a lot of um, violinists suffer from. So obviously you're holding a giant musical instrument a, like three inches away from your ear. And a lot of people carry on some like the heavier brass instruments, stuff from, like back pain and stuff in later life. But cello scrotum was another one of those like medical maladies that was like, you know, talked about in hushed tones amongst male cello players going, mate, you might get some fucking a rough case of cello scrotum if you play this too hard. If you play that particular cello solo too hard, you might rip your nutsack off. I feel so great. I feel sorry in this for the poor che like male cello player who started to get pain in his scrotum once and thought it was cello scrotum. <laughs> it I was like out. googling symptoms on Doctor MD. <laughs> it turns out that he was just wearing jeans that were too tight. I know that cello scrotum isn't real, but I do hope during the thirty-five years it was recognised by the medical community as being a real thing people could suffer from. That at least one bloke got a day off with it because he deserved it at that point. If you've got a pain in your balls and you play the cello, you already got enough things wrong with your life. You can deserve a day off, don't you? Why on your list of issues for a man is cello ranked with painful balls? It's because the cello is not a cool instrument. Like, I'm going to put this out there to the ladies in the audience. If you met a guy in a bar and he said, oh, I'm a musician, you're probably not expecting him to say, oh, I play the cello. You want him to say something like, I play the guitar, I play the piano. Or even the drums are all right. But if he says, I play the cello, it's like this giant, big, fucking whack-off instrument that sounds like shit. It's like, yeah, I play that. Wow. I really can't wait you to serenade me to, with this bastard. But what I always find interesting is, right, I, cause obviously I respect drummers and they're fantastic at their art. But, but they get made fun of so much, well, don't no, they? Why do you get drum solos? Drum solo, I'm going to fuck you off right here. Oh, OK, OK. Drum solos can be amazing. Like, have you ever seen Travis Barker's drum solos? Dr Travis Barker, if you don't know, the drummer from fucking Blink-182. I think at Leeds Fest one year, he did a drum solo upside down where he played on a rotating drum kit that was spun around in the air. That's a fucking drum solo. Or the guy from Rush, who plays the rotating drum kit that spins around, and as it spins around, he plays different things, like pots and pans and shit like that. Or even, like, the drummers from, like, you know, the Blue Man group, who play the pipe. Have you ever seen that? You're putting the clip in. You're putting the clip in of the fucking, um, uh, the drum bone. Who, you know, yeah. The drum bone? The drum bone is a trombone made of PVC piping, and it's the Blue Man group play it, and what they do is they move the pipes in and out of each other to play different things. It's a guy drumming on it. Oh man, just put it in. Clip. The drum bone is amazing. I really love combo instruments where like you've got the like the key tar and Well the thing um... is it's not an instrument, it's PVC piping. Right. That they hit with sticks. And it sounds great. It's like stomp, but better, <laughs> because it's played by like a guy with a blue face. What instrument would you like to learn? The guitar. The key I want the key tar to come back because it's fucking brilliant. I would love to play the key tar. I want to learn the theremin, just I think it would be really funny to whip it out during a party and tell everyone tell you to shut the fuck up. Do you know that the guy who plays fucking... Uh, I found this out the other day, Jim Parsons. Yeah. The guy who plays like Sheldon Cooper in The Big Bang Theory can actually play the theremin. Well, I, I assume he learned it for the show. Yeah, he learned to play it for the show. He yeah. said, oh, it's a piece of piss. <laughs> so I, I think he already plays like the piano or something like that. And he went, oh, the theremin's going to be a piece of piss. And he's literally just you wave your hands around. Just act like you're casting a spell. It's great. So what are you doing? You more go go vidi sa from Jackie Chan. Like, yeah. You're playing all sorts of cool shit. So we know about this now. Yes. So at some point, she has to have come clean. Yes. Um, Dr. Elaine Murphy in 2009, who at that point was a fucking baroness, um, had completely forgotten about, you know, cello scrotum, like the monster. How could she forget about something that affects so many men's scrotums? And so she read about it in another issue with, like, the British Medical Journal and went, wow, is that still a thing? Uh, I should probably tell them that it's not real. And she, like, called them up and did another interview and said, yeah, it's not real, I made it up. Really sorry, guys. Like... It's just something I did as a joke with my husband back in the day. And almost immediately the British medical student was like, oh, fuck, and issued a retraction straight away. <laughs> there must have been a cataclysmic aftermath to the removal of cello scrotum. Not as bad as you think, but a few, like, you know, publications were left with red faces because they'd cited that original study in their own, like, papers on, like, 
common injuries suffered by musicians like tinnitus and violin players and shit like that. So they had to additionally publish their own retraction saying, yeah, this isn't real. We're sorry for mentioning cello scrotum. <laughs> but here's my favourite part. Even after all this, the British Medical Journal still continues to list guitar nipple as a genuine condition. So this is the uh, the last of the mixer and of the uh, the rum we were drinking. So Brad, how does it feel to finally drink in one of these videos alongside me? Feels good. Do you feel like it's like you know made any difference whatsoever to the final product? Well, I mean we went off on it for about 10, 15 minutes earlier. Oh yeah, we're really sorry about that. I'm not sure if that's going to make it into the actual video, but we went we talked about it for 10 minutes about various sports loopholes we've heard about. Most of it'll be in the extended one if we ever yeah, get it. Yeah, the extended one. cut. Oh yeah, yeah. director's we, edition. Well, you know what? It's, we're not, you don't have to go on Patreon to get that. You just have to like go to my YouTube channel. Which is <laughs> just there. plug that. Which is there. Is this spot where we plug things. Oh, we can plug. What, what do you plug? I don't know. Twitter and Instagram. Let's do that. Oh yeah, um, follow Brad on Instagram. He's, he's, <laughs> he's getting pissed off whenever he sees me tweet or post a photo. Why does no one like my photos? Brad, because no one knows who the fuck you are. Plug it now. Put the link right here. Put it right put it over my face. There you go. Done. I can't say fair on that. That's 100,000 eyeballs on your fucking the Instagram. The reason why is because I had an You'd Instagram. You'd have to pay someone money for that. I had an Instagram months before Carl did, and I said to Carl, hey dude, you might want to get an Instagram, it's a good platform for sharing pictures and stuff on. He got it, and within like two days, he sort of quadrupled my number of uh, followers, Kyle. Kyle. and now he's got like a thousand, Kyle and I'm that. stuck on 200 and something. I just live that right kind of life. I live that in a prime influencer lifestyle. No, those people can fuck right off the edge of my penis. Those influencers on Instagram can suck like a quarter mile of dong. It's unreal. God, they are the worst people ever. I remember when we first started this channel, there was a point in one of the early videos where you were like, oh, I'll never refer to myself as a YouTuber. And then when we were having pizza the other day, I remember you saying, oh, it's the lifestyle of a YouTuber, man. That's a joke. <laughs> sure it was. You're slowly transforming. We're getting closer and closer. Oh, no. The day that I do, I'm just gonna be like, oh, no, shoot me in the face. Just end it now. Giant Meteor 2020. Fucking people be much. you'll be one of those people where the people be pasting old tweets that you're saying. Oh look, this point where you said you'd never get the Patreon again, and we're there sitting on our ten thousand patrons. Oh man, those people can fuck right off, man. They're, it's nothing fills me with more like in, like impotent rage than seeing people who are more successful than us on YouTube who also have a Patreon. It's like pick one, make money off YouTube or make money off Patreon. It's like don't do both. And especially when they do sponsorships and stuff like that, and they've got a merch. So I've got five revenue streams, but also give me money. So we don't need to name any specific figures, but we can say me and Brad live comfortably off the money made by this channel from three uploads a week where we don't do ad reads or sponsorships. So just keep that in mind the next time you see someone with more subscribers and uploads more than us who also does sponsorships and has all that other shit, asking you to give them money on Patreon. Just like, you know, just, just a hint. Also, I'd like everyone now to go to the comment section and see how quickly you find a comment about Carl having a piece of his neck missing. <laughs> <laughs> because they'll do it. You know they'll do it. Well, I didn't even notice that. I just put a white t-shirt on. I didn't realise this is the white t-shirt. Oh, actually, oh, wait, here we go. Oh, God. We can do it. Is oh, any... wait, no, is it that one? Is there any pictures behind me? Uh, maybe at the put a picture behind. Just put a picture behind me like a dog. <laughs> yeah, I can blend in. I am now, doggo. I didn't realise you were wearing that specific oh, one. Man, I love this shirt. It's the best. It's, I just love the fact that people don't think it's intentional. Oh, it's my my favourite is someone watches it and goes... They've missed a trick here. Like, do you know when you're like the seven hours you spent editing it and putting all the shit in the background? You never once noticed that, you know, this shirt that's the exact same colour as the green screen blends into the green screen. You know what I'm gonna do now? I'm gonna leave a comment letting them know. I'm all, like, I know it's the four thousandth comment, but that's the one they're gonna notice and they're gonna fix this and they're gonna take down this video and delete the channel. Are we ever gonna talk about it or should we just do it now? I mean, because I'm if, sick of the comments about if it. If people follow me on Twitter, they'd already know. Yes, I do know that the green in this tattoo messed with the green screen because I instructed the tattooist who did it, who is a close personal friend, to mix a shade of green that was the exact same colour as this green screen. To the point where I took in a picture of the green screen and told them to mix a shade of green that was the same colour purely to piss off Brad. You know what's annoying, right? I've I've gotten used to the fact that there's a piece of your arm missing. That's just part of it now. Yeah. What's annoying is when we do bits. Like the whiteboard bit in a previous video, and I'm like, well, for that bit, it, it can't be see-through because it's a bit. But you know what? It is, and there's not. Aside from going through it frame by frame, because I can do it. Hold you your could. arm up. 
Yeah. Or drought, right? You I'm, could yeah, make that, it look That fine. is now visible because I'm going to do it in pause. Yeah. I can do it, but it takes fucking My ages. My favourite bit as well is, Brad told, I told Brad about this before, Fat, and he went, I'm just going to get a blue screen. So do you know what I did? I went and got a blue bit of a tattoo put in. And they said, well, we can always get a red screen. He went, oh, yeah, good luck with that, mate. Yeah, my, suggestion, <laughs> red as well. my suggestion was to get one of the chroma screens. You can change the colour of the screen with lights on the camera. So I made sure so you got every put single every colour, colour on. rainbow. There's like, I think I got the entire Roy G. Biff scale in there. <laughs> just to make sure Brad will never, ever be able to make a video on this channel again that isn't where I'm not fucking with a green screen in some way.